Okay, well, I just really want to try to explain the essence of natural inclusionality, which can actually be understood very simply and very quickly with just a little bit of thought and a little bit of imagination. And we can begin to get there simply by asking a very, very simple question, uh, which is how is it possible or what, what might makes it possible or what is needed fundamentally to enable a natural form to be distinguishable from its surroundings? Just that question. We start with that question and I might illustrate it by saying, take a look at my hand here. What makes my hand distinguishable from its surroundings? If it wasn't distinguishable from its surroundings, you wouldn't see my hand. You'd just see that my hand merged with the, my surroundings. So there has to be something which makes my hand distinguishable from my surroundings. So how could that be? Now, if we think about it, we, we, it almost immediately becomes apparent that there is a presence in my hand which is not present immediately around my hand. And so we can distinguish we can distinguish my hand because there is a presence within my hand which is not present, yeah, around my hand. If I take my hand away, then you you, you all you see is what appears like an empty space where my hand used to be. If I put my hand back there, you see my hand again. But when I take my hand away, the, em the apparent empty space hasn't disappeared, it's still there. So in a sense, you know, my, my, my hand is there, it's a presence which is distinguishable. I take my hand away, well you don't see where, you, you, it's not as though my hand has left a hole behind, okay? So just think about that relationship between seeing the presence of my hand and something must be present in my hand which makes it distinguishable from the sur its surrounding space. But when I take my hand away, we don't sort of see a black hole, if you like, where my hand was. So what that means is that we're beginning to recognise that in order for the natural form to be distinguishable, there have to be just two kinds of presences. A presence everywhere, which you can think of as a sort of general context or medium, but which is without limit and essentially everywhere. You can just think of that as natural space, which has no limits. And that, that presence is everywhere, but my hand is somewhere. So when, I, when you see my hand, you see my hand as an inclusion of everywhere in somewhere. Quite simple. So we have a kind of presence which is everywhere and a kind of presence which is within my hand. Two kinds of presences, which we might call an intangible presence, which is space everywhere without limit, and a tangible presence or observable or feelable presence within my hand. Now we have to think about the relationship between the tangible presence, which is within my hand, and that presence everywhere. We've already said, I can't remove what's present everywhere. Take my hand away, that presence everywhere is still there. Put my hand there, that presence everywhere is still there. It's continuous, without limit. But there is some presence in my hand which makes it nonetheless distinguishable from what immediately surrounds it. So we have this relationship between what is tangibly present and what is intangibly present. Now are we because that presence everywhere can't be removed, can't be displaced by my hand, yeah, we have to sort of, we, we suddenly realise that the tangible presence and the intangible presence are mutually inclusive. They include each other. They can't be separated. Try to imagine what would happen if we did try to separate them. What if that presence that is within my hand was to become literally devoid of space, where would my hand be? It would be nowhere. It would lose its dimensionality. It would have no shape or size. Okay, so the space is needed to give my hand shape or size. If my hand isn't there, then we have a formless presence everywhere. But we don't see any form then <laughs> because, because we've removed the tangible aspect. So we've arrived at a recognition that the tangible presence and the intangible presence 
both need to be present for natural form to be, pre to, to be distinguishable. It's still slightly puzzling because if you ask that question in the way that we've conventionally been led to think, which separates the tangible from the intangible, and you sort of think, well, there must be, you know, th th there must be a sort of a totality of 100%, and <laughs> that 100% must, must when, I, when I put my hand there, some of that totality of 100% space has somehow disappeared and been replaced by my hand. But that wouldn't work. Yeah, it couldn't work because because the two are necessarily mutually inclusive. So how could we arrive at this idea? You know, in the normal way, our normal logic is sort of looks at things in a very static sort of way and tries to sort of think about, a, you know, a totality of 100%, which is part this and part that. But what I'm talking about can't be part, part tangible and part intangible because the two are mutually inclusive. So there's only one way in which we can actually understand it. We've understood that the space is continuous, without limit, everywhere, and it's essentially intangible. It has no friction. It, it doesn't resist the presence of my hand. It allows, permits my, present, my hand to be present. So the space, if you like to think of it, is allowance. My hand itself, uh, whilst it might look stationary as a hand here, we have to think ourselves inside my hand to, to what will allow my hand to be present essentially and the space to be present too and be mutually inclusive. There's only way that, one way that can happen is that we have to move from a static representation of the world and a static logic of either this or that to a dynamic logic, a flow logic of a dynamic presence yeah, within and as an inclusion of a stillness which is everywhere. So if I wiggle my hand around like that, it looks like a blur. And that's essentially what we've got. We, ha we have to have the tangible presences. When we look at it at a sufficiently close enough or for, for long enough, it has to be in continuous motion. If it stops for a moment, we've split one from the other. But, so we have to have one of these presences in continuous motion, the other presence as continuous frictionless stillness, and each presence is within the other. If we try and split them apart, then we split time apart from space and matter. Yeah, so instead of that, what we have is time as an inclusion of a continuous mobile presence, which is a natural inclusion of space everywhere. We've, origin we've suddenly arrived at a different perception of natural form from the one that we've all been taught. It's very simple, but we've arrived at that very simple, different perception in which instead of seeing space and boundaries as mutually exclusive and definitive, we now see space and boundaries as continuous, space is continuous, Boundaries are dynamically continuous as energy or mobility and each necessarily includes the other. And if they don't mutually include one another, if, if the motion stops, time stops, and the universe collapses. Mm -hmm. It's very, very straightforward. So we have a new way of thinking in which we recognize that boundaries, which give rise to the, make, make forms naturally distinct or distinguishable, are at some level always in continuous motion they have to be so motion is intrinsic not forced from outside it has to be within yeah within whatever it, within the form itself it's not pushed the form isn't being pushed some from somewhere else the energy is within the form yeah and so we've got that idea and we've understood also simultaneously not only that boundaries are dynamically continuous and that they're natural interfacings between inner world and outer world, but we've appreciated that for those forms to be distinguishable at all, there has to be this other presence, which is everywhere, and without motion in itself, and continuous and infinite. So we have the relationship between the local somewhere, mm and the non-local everywhere 
which gives rise to the manifestation of natural form. And it's as simple and obvious, really, as that. But that simple, obvious understanding, if we accept it, means that we have to change the fundamental logic of opposition upon which all Western thought has been constructed for thousands of years.